Hi guys, welcome to the webinar. So we have Trisha. I met Trisha when we applied for the grant. She's an amazing person. I thought that she just had a job of sitting in the office, shuffling papers and you know, looking at stuff, not going to the field, etc. But to give you an idea, let me just tell you, I mean, you can find all her profile somewhere else. I'm not going to go into that. She's done a lot of stuff and she's achieved a lot. But Thank you, Venkat. That's very kind. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I'm, I'm only talking facts. You've given me the money now. I don't have to worry about buttering you up. That's okay. true. That's true. <laughs> Trisha will definitely tell you a lot more about the, tr uh, about the trust and uh, all the details. But what I wanted to add in there was the amazing statistics that she has shared with me, uh, which happened last season when she actually came uh, last year, sorry, when she visited us for a field trip. And even while she was sitting and talking with me, she was flooded with calls, with WhatsApp messages from all over India, from all the other people who were vying for the same uh, grant. So their team was very, very lean. There were only four members, including Trisha in that, right? They were covering 13 states in 45 days of field evaluation visits, they had 28 applicants in total spread all across the country, yeah, including the Andamans, by the way, just to give you an idea. Trisha personally flew on 35 different flights, logging a total of 70 hours. You can understand why during these COVID times now, all the airlines are closing down because she no, she's no longer flying. Yeah. <laughs> I actually and, flew every single airline available in India during that period. I, I am not surprised at all. And, and she's logged 150 hours just on the road. You will understand what she's all about more by listening to her talk. So I'm going to just hand over to Trisha. Trish, it's all yours. Take it away. Thanks, Venkat. And thank you for having me here and for putting together this wonderful platform for people to learn so much about not only marine habitats, but let me add down. Um, so to start with, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the place that I work at. So it's called the Habitats Trust. We were founded in 2018 by Roshni Nadar, Nadar Malhotra and Shikhar Malhotra. Um, so I was one of the first employees at the Trust and I actually joined in June of 2018, whereas we founded in August 2018. So I was part of the team that actually got to help set up the Habitats Trust. And then Right after we were founded, we decided to launch this grants program. It felt like a natural progression to us, uh, simply because as a new organization, we wanted to explore different habitats, learn about the good work that's already been happening on ground, rather than come into a new landscape and replicate work that may already be underway. Um, so the first cycle of the grants was between August to December 2018. Um, so, in our first year, we've launched with the first three grants, which has now become the grants for organizations, the Strategic Partnership Grant, the Lesson on Habitats Grant, and the Lesson on Species Grant. It was very important to us, especially as someone who's worked in conservation for almost a decade, uh, that we did something for Lesson on Habitats and Lesson on Species, because there is a lot of conservation funding available for the charismatic me mega mammals. And we see a lot of funding going into our more prominent parks like Kanha, Bandhavgarh, Pench, Tadoba, Corbett, Ranthambore. But how often is that same amount of funding going into the smaller parks that you find in the Northeast or in the other central, uh, Eastern Indian landscapes and Western Indian landscapes? So that was kind of the idea behind the lesson on habitats, lesson on species category. Plus, personally, I had tried to apply for Pangolin funding so many times and been rejected for tiger projects, that this was also like a bit of a personal mission for me to actually find funding for these lesson on species. Um, so in 2019, we kind of learned from our mistakes. And in the first year, we had organizations and individuals applying in these three categories. 2019, we felt that the individuals were at a disadvantage when going up just against the organizational structure and strength of the larger organizations. And that's when we came up with the Conservation Hero Grant. This is exclusively for individuals who are not full-time employees of any NGOs or on the board of any uh, registered NGOs. So the recipients of our grant are selected through a structured pro process that tries to measure both the applicant strength, the capacity to deliver, and the sustainability of the proposed work. 
we do a four level evaluation in an effort to keep it as transparent and fair as possible each level of evaluation actually involves different uh, external stakeholders except for one level where the phd team comes in which venkat was telling you about which is the field level verification round so our process begins with the first level screening and evaluation after we've received the applications through our online portal we have a grant uh, we have a grant auditor who actually goes through every application and makes sure that the proposals are eligible for the grant as well as we have four external consultants who are ex ifs officers and experts in the field who read every single application and read, grade every single application for discussion at a consultants round table at the end of the round table we select the people who will go forward for field level verification which is 6 to 7 per category each year the habitats trust team goes on ground and does a very in depth quantitative as well as qualitative assessment of the projects on, that are being proposed and we present our findings to our sub jury the sub jury is the one who actually selects the three finalists who will go forward in each category to the jury round uh the final jury round we have our four jury members bahal dat very prominent conservation biologist author and environmental journalist in india dr mk ranjit singh who is one of the architects of the wildlife protection act of india uh mr brian heath who's the founder and ceo of the mara triangle conservation area in kenya and shikhar malhotra who is the trustee of the habitats trust So the jury is the ones who finally decide the four winners at the end of a day long meeting where all of our finalists actually visit us at our head office in Noida present their work personally to the jury and then the next day we have a felicitation event where we announce the winners Now uh, this is a question i get asked very often how do we select the winners what are our criteria for really evaluating proposals and saying yes this should go forward and no this should not So we've tried to be as fair and keep our evaluation and our criteria as fixed and all encompassing as possible. So I'll just quickly take you through some of the key criteria criteria that we look at. We look at first the applicant profile under which we try and see the strength and capacity to deliver based on the past work experience as well as the CVs of the applicants. We look at the key project personnel and the team strength. Team strength is a bit of an odd thing to look at, but we actually want to make sure that if someone is proposing something in a very large landscape, they actually have the team size to follow through with that. And then finally, financial sustenance and fundraising strength. We try to think of our grant as a small seed funding to try and fund either a scale up operation or a brand new initiative that somebody would like to try out, very similar to what Coastal Impacts doing with their new. for it into micro fragmentation um so since this is a one year grant we just want to also make sure that once this funding for, uh, is over our applicants have the capacity to further fundraise and continue the good work that's being done on ground next we look at the project profile and under the project profile the first thing we look at is the problem statement and the relevance with re respect to the target landscape which is very important to us it should be the right proposal proposed in the right location where this is this work is really needed Next is the status of the target habitat and species. Yes, we do look at the IUCN red list. We look at the um, Indian Wildlife Protection Act and which schedule the species are listed on. And based on that, we do give preference to species which would be on a critically endangered or an endangered um, animal or uh, species of flora. Next, we look at the activity plan and methodology. How pragmatic is the execution plan that's been uh, put forth? then we look at the stakeholder involvement we believe that conservation has to be done in consultation with the local communities your forest department over there and if they they aren't they don't get a sense of ownership in the project in the long run the project usually more often than not is unable to succeed next we look at the budget validation how well has the budget been mapped out one of the things that's very important to us is that a large portion of the budget should actually go towards the activities that are happening on ground and in in contrast to the amounts that are spent on salaries or on administrative costs um then we have sustainability replicability and scalability so sustainability as i touched upon in financial sustenance is the long term plan that's in place for the project replicability and scalability is important to us because if we find a good model we'd like to be able to take that to other habitats and other landscapes which are facing the same threats or facing even more severe threats and test those models out over there finally is the impact and um, assessment measures and indicators 
So I feel that this is one of the areas where conservation, I, and I believe myself as a conservationist as well, we need to strengthen upon, um, especially if we want to tap into CSR funding and corporate funding. One thing that's very important is to map out clear indicators so that we can say, yes, we've achieved 25% of our objective or we've achieved 75% of our objective. So that, that also gives us the opportunity to introspect and understand where we failed and how we can strengthen going forward. So that's one of the things we look at. And now without further ado, I kind of want to tell you about the good work that's happening on ground. So today I'll be sharing the work of our seven winners three in 2018, four in 2019, as well as all of our wonderful finalists. We have 14 finalists and I'll briefly take you through their work. So to start with, um, in 2008, we'll go through the 2018 ones first. So in 2018, the Strategic Partnership Grant went to Foundation for Ecological Security, who are working in three ranges in Nagaland. The Lesson on Habitat Grant went to Reforge Marine Conservation, who are working in Chidiatapu, South Andaman Island. The Lesson on Species Grant went to Sayadri Nasar Gumitra, who are working in Ratnagiri District, Maharashtra. The Strategic Partnership Grant went to Aranyak, who are working in 2019, sorry. The Strategic Partnership Grant went to Aranyak, who are working in Manas National Park. The Lesson on Habitats Grant, and here you can boot Venkat if you want, went to Coastal Impact, who are working in St. George, uh, Grand Island and Pekino Island off the coast of Goa. The Lesson on Species grant went to MetaString Foundation, who are actually working in the, Meta, in the Western Ghats across Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. But for ease, I'll just put down one marker in Kerala. And the first ever winner of the Conservation Hero grant was Neeti Mahesh, who is working in Kurt District of, of Karnataka. So to go through a little bit about the work that these amazing, these amazing recipients are doing, to start with, Foundation for Ecological Security is working on a project entitled Safeguarding Endangered and Threatened Species Through Strengthening Governance and Management of Community Conserved Areas in Nagaland, which I'll just refer to CCAs going forward for ease. Their locations are Mount Pona, Zulai, Konama Landscape, the Zanabu Meluri Range, and Satoi Range Landscapes in Nagaland. They have two key objectives of their project. The first is to develop and implement species conservation and monitoring plans by building evidence-based knowledge on species uh, status and habitats. The next is to evolve landscape level fed federations and strengthen multi-stakeholder engagement for improved conservation and monitoring. Now, I'm trying to do my presentation a little dif uh, differently today, so you'll have to bear with me. It's going to be mostly images, and I'm just going to be talking you through some of the work and the highlights of the work. So let's take a look at some of the, my favorite images from FES's work. So as mentioned, FES is working with 26 CCAs in Nagaland to map their biodiversity and create conservation plans for them. Uh, so they begin with using printed satellite images and along with the village council, the CCA management committees, the youth and women representatives, the team has identified species habitats, the distribution of species in these habitats, as well as the characteristics of the habitat. Um, they also try and map existing and potential threats emerging in the area. Under the project, over 20 villages have now instated jurisdiction-wide bans on hunting of the Chinese pangolin, the Blitz shagopan, the Indian hornbill, and the Western hula gibbon which are the four target uh, species that FES is looking at under the project. One quote I'd like to share with you, which kind of touched my heart and I hope you enjoy it, is uh, from Mr. Adibi, who is the secretary of the Village Development Board of New Parent Village. And he says on the hunting ban of Chinese pangolin in their village jurisdiction, I asked my son not to hunt anymore. He did not utter a word as he is considered to be the best hunter in the village. I hope he will follow the council rules. And I'm happy to report, yes, the son did follow through, as did everyone else in the village, and there has been no hunting in New Parent Village. Uh, finally, another incident I actually want to share with you from the field is in the third quarter of 2019, there was sort of a bad incident that happened where a clouded leopard was hunted down in Satoi Range. And this brought about huge outcry among the village community. And so the village council and the forest, Ma forest management committee of Sutoho village came together and they passed a resolution for complete protection of the clouded leopard in, across their 
village jurisdiction, as well as absolutely no hunting. They're now approaching other villages and other CCAs in the Satoi range landscape and encouraging them to implement no hunting bans as well. So part of the work that um, FES is doing, as you can see on the screen right now, is assessing the biomass of Joom fallow lands and they've selected 270 plots in two CCAs for this process. And they're looking at lands between 10 to 10, uh, one to 10 years and they're trying to study the vegetation as well as do random surveys of biodiversity so they can understand what biodiversity exists within these Joom fallow lands. And so protection measures can be put in there and Joom can be also carried out more responsibly. So I realize my presentation has ended, but I'm not done talking yet. I hope you saw the last few images of a gentleman going into these burrows with, the, uh, with his mobile phone. That's actually one of my favorite stories from uh, the grants. Our lesser known species grant winner, Sayadri Nasarg Mitra, traveled all the way from Ratna Ratnagiri in Maharashtra to Nagaland to actually share their knowledge and experience working on pangolins with FES and to help them create a Chinese pangolin conservation action plan for implementation in Nagaland. So that's the kind of uh, exchange of ideas, the exchange of resources also that we hope to try and create through the grants process. So next, I'd like to talk about ReefWatch Marine Conservation, and they have a project entitled Reef Generate, Reviving Coral Reefs in the Andaman Islands. They're working in Chiriatapu, South Andaman Island, and their objectives are the creation of artificial reefs with mineral accretion systems, pictures of which you'll see in a bit, creation of coral nurseries to grow more resilient coral for tra transplantation, local capacity building for reef maintenance. So without further ado, let's go into their imagery. So under the project, ReefWatch has uh, deployed nine structures so far, two each in 2016, 17, and 18, and three mini structures in 2019. What they do is rescue naturally fragmented coral, which may have been damaged from uh, learner scuba divers or through anchor damage. And they uh, attach these corals back onto these metal structures, which you see on the screen. These metal structures are attached to what they call mineral accretion devices, which is very similar to the BioRock method and actually promotes the calcification of corals, strengthening the coral and helping them grow faster. Uh, as part of the project, they're also trying to grow more resilient corals through fertilization in their nursery. And to this end, they've started putting out coral traps. They put them out one week before the full moon and they persist till one week after the full moon. Um, they have selected two reefs for the process and are working with four coral species. So that's a total of eight traps in each reef, two per species to try and uh, collect the coral um, spawn to fertilize the two individuals. Unfortunately, they're yet to be able to identify the spawning events. So in the meantime, they are using their uh, nursery to test out the microfragmentation method. They had visited Florida and went to the Moats Marine Lab in Florida where they met with Dr. Vaughn, who explained the method, method to them. And according to the microfragmentation technique, it suggests that by fragmenting coral into very small pieces and growing them on a substrate such as a small cement stub, which is what ReefWatch is using, in labs, the coral generates faster. You can see the cement stubs on the screen right now. Part of their project is also working with the local youth and they do a lot of awareness for the local youth, which you can see. They have also trained three local youth, which is Sumitra Biswas, Abhishek Das and Rakesh, who are on the screen right now. They have been trained in scuba diving as well as cor coral transplantation and they hope that they will take over the long-term maintenance of the artificial reefs that they've set up. Um, in their find the, they, as you can see on the screen, their artificial reefs have now become a safe haven for many species of fish as well as invertebrates. Some of the fish that they've seen are the razorfish, the yellow and blue grouper, the catfish, juvenile octopus, as well as they've observed many species of nudibranchs. And you'll just see a couple of pictures of nudibranchs coming up. Now the next step for them is that they have extended this proposal and submitted a proposal to the forest department to expand the project to Havelock, where they've identified three potential restoration sites. They're just waiting on permissions from the forest department, which they hope will come through soon. And that's hopefully going to be the next step for ReefWatch. 
Next, we're going to talk a bit about Sayadri and Sargmitra moving back closer to this coast uh, to conservation of the Indian pangolin through community participation in the Konkan region of the Western Ghats. Uh, Sayadri's project was based in Sangameshwar, Dapoli, and Mandangai blocks of uh, Ratnagiri district. Their objectives are to generate community participation and support for pangolin conservation. They want to assess the ecology and present status of the Indian pangolin in the pr project area and implement a monitoring system to control poaching and hunting. As we know, the pangolin is the most trafficked mammal in the world. And so poaching is a very key concern. Unfortunately, in India, what we saw between 2015 to now is that the organized tiger poachers, especially in central India, have now started moving towards pangolin poaching because it's less detectable and the penalties are not as severe. So that is something that Sayadri is trying to crack down on. Coming to their photo presentation. So under the project, Sayadri first started with a survey of pangolin burrows as well as pangolin habitats in their project landscape. And uh, they're using camera traps for this process and they've been able to capture 192 photos and 49 videos of pangolin activity on their camera traps. They're using this to better understand the species ecology as well as its behavior in the wild. And they hope to use the analysis and the data they've collected to further develop conservation action for the animal. So they also work very heavily on awareness activities. And the awareness is not just to garner support for the species, but also this awareness uh, that they've created has led to the rescue of 13 pangolins, wild pangolins from across the Konkan region. These rescue operations were conducted in collaboration with the forest department and the local community. And at this point, I just want to share a couple of very uh, noteworthy rescue operations that actually happened. The first was on 14th of March, 2019, where an elderly gentleman who had actually attended one of Sayadri's awareness programs, um, he heard some dogs barking in the street and he thought it may have been a leopard. So he gingerly walked out of his home to explore what had happened. And he found a pack of dogs were actually scratching on a pangolin because it had turned into a ball and they were trying to attack it. So he shooed away the dogs and immediately called, into the, called in the forest department. And even in that wee hour of the night, they were able to rescue the pangolin and release it back into its natural habitat. The second one is a very interesting case to me, at least, because it took place over the span of months. So in the month of April 2019, a gentleman from... Nandubur district, which is a neighboring district to Ratnagiri, called the Sayadri team and said that um, I want to learn more about the pangolin and I want to understand more about the species. And months later, in September, late September 2019, that same gentleman used the knowledge and information that he gained from the Sayadri other people because they had never seen an animal like this before and were absolutely petrified. He was able to placate them with explaining to them the importance of the pangolin, the ecological role that it plays, as well as then called in the forest department to rescue the animal and take him away. So now, I, I'm sorry, I paused the video for a bit because I was lagging a bit behind. What, um, oops, oh, 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 I am not doing a very good job of my videos right now. <laughs> Please bear with me. Oh, there we go. And I can come back to around here. Yeah. So on 16th of February, 2019, the, the team at Ratna, at uh, Sayadri organized a World Pangolin Day celebration with the Forest Department Department. Uh, at this uh, event, they organized a student rally. They organized art competitions. They organized a film screening all on pangolins as well as they unveiled their new mascot, who is my personal favorite mascot ever, called Kaulu, who you'll see him in a couple of And the name Kaulu has come from the Marathi word for, for the Indian pangolin, which is the Kaulu Manjar. At this event, that, there we go, that's Kaulu, perfect. A children's book on the Pangolin and very notably this a chapter of this book moved to the 2019 recipient and Venkat's probably at the edge of his seat because he knows he's coming up right after Aranyak. So first we're going to talk about Aranyak though. 
whose project is entitled Partnering to Secure and Recover the Manas Grasslands and Threatened Species. They're working, obviously, in Manas National Park, and they, as part of their work, they are serving Manas National Park to map habitat quality and, to, and use to prioritize restoration sites and inform development and conservation strategies. They want to generate population and habitat use data for key endangered species, as well as quantify users and uses of grassland habitats. They're using the Bengal florican and the pygmy hog, which you can see in the top right corner as their indicator species for this purpose. Now moving to their video, which has some of my favorite animals, which is the smallest pig in the world, the pygmy hog. So with the aim of strengthening and also creating long-term grassland management plans, which unfortunately we currently lack in the country, Aranyak is investigating the influence of fire, grazing, cutting, and a combination of all of these factors. In 27 in the plots where they're testing each of these methods, each of these methods. They're also conducting surveys for the Bengal florican and the pygmy hog across Manas needs, as well as assess the health of Manas National Park's grasslands. <clears throat> Sorry. The team has also been approached by the Assam, Assam Forest Department for replication of their habitat monitoring framework in other sub Himalayan grasslands. They've started their work with Orang National Park, which has also been very successful for them in the pygmy hog reintroduction. Um, <clears throat> where they now have an established population as well as a breeding population. Now, um, to actually reintroduce these uh, pygmy hogs, you may be wondering how. So they set up the Pygmy Hog Conservation Program, which is a collaborative effort of Dagral Wildlife Conservation Trust, the IUCN Wild Pig Specialist Group, the Forest Department of Assam, the Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change, Ecosystem India, and Aranyak. And each year they breed at least 10 female hogs, they maintain about 70 captive bred hogs at the moment between their center in uh, Basista in Guwahati, as well as their center in Potasli in Namiri National Park. And each year, each year they release about 10 to 12 hogs. So far, so between 2018 to 2020, they released a total of 130 captive bred hogs into four protected grasslands in Orang National Park, in Sonai Rupai Wildlife Sanctuary, in Bornadi Wildlife Sanctuary, as well as most recently in Manas National Park. Now, in April 2020, I think many of us may have heard, uh, Assam as well as Arunachal Pradesh recorded India's first ever cases of the African swine flu, which is suspected to have come in perhaps from China and Indonesia through pork products. And the African swine flu, flu just to put it in context, in its most acute form, has a mortality rate of 95%. Sorry, I'm just going to give you a nice cute picture of the pygmy hog while I go through the rest of, the, uh, of my points. It has a mortality rate as high as 95%. So in the month of April, when this infection was detected, the numbers of infected pigs were 10,920 and they recorded 3,701 pigs who died. Now, to actually help uh, combat this, this new threat that's emerged for this very small, tiny little hog, Aranyak is working to upgrade biosecurity measures at their two captive breeding centers. The first, as I mentioned, in Guwahati and the second in Nameri National Park. And THT has been fortunate enough to be able to support them with this. And uh, so very soon you may have, uh, let me quickly just show you that. They are now creating new constructions, new, um, sa new sanitization facilities altogether to ensure that the virus doesn't spread to their captive bred pygmy hogs. Now, coming to coastal impact. So, Venkat, wait, wait, now wait, I... wait, 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 you, I can't hear you because the uh, number of people cheering, you see here, can you hear that? I can hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Venkat, at this point, if I make a mistake, please correct me. <laughs> Sure, sure. So, Coastal Impact proposed a project called Trans Coral Transplantation Aids for Preservation of Coral Patches off the Coast of Goa. And they're working in three islands, Grand Island, St. George, and Pequeno Islands of Goa. Their objectives are to implement coral transplantation remedies for maintaining and repairing coral reefs, 
to rescue opportunistic coral fragments and maintain an in-situ nursery. Multiplication of coral fragments using micro-fragmentation technique, which we already touched upon with Reefwatch's work as well. To install per permanent mooring buoys to avoid anchor damage to the coral reefs. Now coming into the imagery, and I'm sorry, you can blame Venkat for the poor imagery right now because he gave me only low resolution photographs. So let's talk a little bit about coastal impact. So coastal impact kicked off their project with a survey of the reefs surrounding their three target uh, islands, Pequeno, St. George and Grand Island. Through their surveys, they noticed extensive damage to the reefs as well as incidents of coral, ble coral bleaching. But what they also observed was good biodiversity of marine life still persisting within these reefs. Now, to prevent further da anchor damage and further damage to the existing reefs, coral, uh, Coastal Impact has actually deployed three mooring buoys at two locations. There are two mooring buoys that have been deployed at Suzy Tech and one at a location they call the Coral Garden. They plan to deploy another two similar mooring buoys post the monsoon season. Now, as part of their coral trans... By the way, that's Venkat on the screen. I don't think he knows I have this image of him. <laughs> oh, as wonderful looking. <laughs> and right after that is a big Malabar grouper. <laughs> As part of their coral transplantation activities, Coastal Impact has set up to, uh, has rescued two large naturally broken coral fragments, each measured about one foot in length. And they collected these fragments and in saline water, in salt water, sorry, in sea water to try and replicate the natural conditions. They carefully moved these fragments to their in-situ site location in Shelter Cove, Grand Island. Once the, the team went underwater and actually cut the fragments into small two centimeter square pieces underwater using gardening shears and then attached them onto cement and ceramic roof tiles and uh, submerged them into their in-situ nursery. Over the next month, they monitored these coral fragments and they noticed some silting as well as some bleaching. So now they're in the process of learning and experimenting with techniques. They've gone into consultation with other people who are working on coral and very notably have created a very strong network. I'm sure many of the people who are participating in this webinar today included to work as a coalition towards creating better techniques and developing more scientific techniques to saving our coral reefs. As you can see on screen there, we see the one foot coral fragment carefully being moved carefully being attached onto the ceramic tiles. Now that is the way that they actually submerge the coral and you'll see they've put about five corals. They, in total, they have submerged so far 14 coral fragments. And that's the bleaching you can see in the bottom right corner. And finally, just some nice imagery to end with. And that is Coastal Impact. Okay, Venkata, just one, that was okay. one oh, minor correction. Huh. We have uh, actually put, uh, created two beds, totaling okay. 96 pieces of coral now. There are 48 pieces in each uh, bed. So we have oh, chosen wow. two different locations and done that already because we managed to sneak out in May, on the 9th and 11th of May, to be precise. Surreptitiously uh, sneak out. <laughs> yes and actually put these in because I wanted that done before the advent of the monsoons to see whether they will survive that and how they will fare. So now I'm all eager to go back and check. Whether oh, they, so you haven't been able to check up on them we yet? We haven't gone, managed to go out after because well, there's... Whenever you do go good. out, you have a plus one for Oh, your for life. sure. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So next, I'd just like to talk about our Let's Known Species winner 2019, which is the Metastring Foundation. They're working on citizen-based conservation of the Malabar tree toad in the Western Ghats of Maharashtra, Goa, Kerala, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu. Their objectives are to assess the conservation status and the needs of the Malabar tree toad through citizen-based field surveys, identify priority areas and habitats of the Malabar tree toad, and finally, to develop local capacity for serving and monitoring of the species status in the long term. So coming to the imagery and some few little highlights of their work. So the Malabar tree toad, I'd just like to tell you a bit about it to begin with, is a very unique and elusive little frog. It's critically endangered and it's only visible for about two weeks before the first monsoon shower of the season. 
So unfortunately, as you can imagine, this has been a very tough year for MetaString Foundation because they weren't able to go out and conduct their surveys on ground in the two weeks prior to the monsoon showers. So they've actually had to move their entire field survey to 2021. But what they have done in the meantime is select eight potential, site, uh, potential survey sites um, across this Western Ghats region and also create a network of 53 citizens located across the project area who can potentially next year act as local team leaders for the survey. Now, what they've also used this time doing and uh, what I think most of us are trying to do is to strengthen their online presence and engagement. And they recently launched an app which is available on Android phones called the Frogwatch app. The Frogwatch app is a great app where you can actually go out there and if you spot a frog, even in your own home, in your backyard or in a wild habitat, you can upload it onto Frogwatch. You can find out what that frog species is as well as contribute to conservation efforts by helping MetaString Foundation and the India Biodiversity Portal team create a map of the distribution of these frogs, as well as understand the habitat needs, the status, the ecology, and threats to these frogs across the Western Ghats, and why not the whole of India? So that's the Frog Watch app. It's available on Play Store, I believe it's called on Android. Sorry, I'm an iPhone user, so I'm now going to buy an Android just to download the app. And finally, uh, just through this app and various reports that have come in through their entire citizens network, they have managed to capture 91 reports of the Malabar tree toad from across the Western Ghats. 91 may not sound like a very impressive, impressive number to you, but trust me, as somebody who was wading through this entire landscape, desperately looking for this frog and finding just about everything but the Malabar tree toad, this is a very unique experience to actually be able to go out there and find the Malabar tree toad. Next, we come to Neeti Mahesh, our first ever lesson or sorry conservation hero grant winner in 2019 and her project is called riparian habitat conservation along the kaveri river in cool district of course she's in cool district and she's working specifically around the Bare reserve forest her objectives are to enable res restoration of riparian habitats by establishing a native riparian flora nursery sourced by the jainu kurba honey collector tribe and creating a river monitoring network with educational institutions in Kulk. Coming to some beautiful imagery from Neeti's projects. So what I'd also just like to take a moment to mention is not only is Neeti the 2019 recipient of the Conservation Hero Grant, Neeti actually first met us in 2018 when she was one of the finalists for our lesson on habitat grant, which Neeti is on the right of the screen right now. And that's her team members, the Jainu Kurba tribals. So she actually is one of those cases who applied. She went all the way to the finals. She did not receive the grant, came back in the next year, she took the grant home. Uh, she is under the project. One of the great achievements that Neeti has had is along with the local Jainu Kurba honey collector tribals, she has published a riparian field guide on um, riparian flora as well as restoration and uh, plantation techniques for these riparian flora. She's also been able to create her own riparian nursery and she's now supplying these saplings to the forest department as well as the local citizen groups for plantation drives. Because the area where she's working in the Bari Reserve Forest faces an extreme threat from monoculture of coffee plantations and silver oaks coming in. And now it's seeing increased flooding each year, especially given what we are hearing, the stories that are coming from the southern Indian states. Neeti's work has become even more important than ever because I believe... And on Neeti's side, where there is still the riparian flora, which you're seeing on the screen, the water had receded up to one and a half kilometers. On the other side, the water had come up to five kilometers. So that just immediately provides an example of just how important this flora is and how essential it is for us to start working on its conservation. So another key aspect of Neeti's work, as you'll see right now on the screen, is working with kids. So Neeti does a lot of awareness programs for children to actually create a deep respect and understanding of the rivers which we depend on for our life. She's also now creating her own website and application called River Watch. And on River Watch, with the help of the local government schools, Neeti hopes to monitor the quality of the Kaveri River and in the long term, take this to the entire Indian river system. 
and she's been training the kids on how to use these water monitoring techniques as well as teachers so they can teach uh, train the future generations that are coming in and they can update directly onto the river watch website which i believe she hopes to have read a little bit with you guys about it and um, so that covers our recipients but as i was selling venkat as we were just chatting before we started this session i would also like to take this opportunity to actually talk about the wonderful finalists that we have each year whose work is equally as good equally as strong except we're in the very difficult position where we can only give away one grant per year what we try to do is give away 10% of the grant value to each of our finalists and without further ado here we go into our finalists and this is a map that if here so gives you an idea of just the amount of travel that venkat was talking about we do to begin with the 2018 strategic partnership grant finalists are balipara foundation who are working in udalguri district of assam and conservation wildlands trust who are working in pench right on the border of madhya pradesh and maharashtra the lesson on habitats finalists were narayan sharma who is working in the upper brahmaputra valley of assam and neeti mahesh our 2019 recipient who is still even at that point working in kodagu district of karnataka the lesson on species finalists were earth day network india who were working all the way up near srinagar in dachigam national park and helpers who are working in kaziranga national park and the brahmaputra river surrounding it in assam Fine. now let's move on to our 2019 finalists first we have seeds trust who are working in ayalur in tamil nadu we have wildlife conservation society of india again they are working in three states but just for representation i put them into the state that i visited which is up they are also working in assam and west bengal i'll tell you a little bit about all of their work in the next while we go through the images then we had center for environment education who was the first finalist for the habit that's grant who are working in manipur in zala wildlife sanctuary and our other finalist for the lesson on habitat grant was omkar foundation who are working in park bay tamil nadu lesson on species grant finalists were atri who are working along the tunga and bhadra rivers in karnataka university of science and technology meghalaya who are working in dudwa national park in uttar pradesh then coming to our conservation hero grant and you'll see three finalists here because we cheated a bit in 2019 we just loved so many of these individuals that we took forward four people for our finals and uh, while neeti won the finals and noko bandana and pooja received some little bit of donations towards the work that they're doing and also we got the opportunity to host them in delhi and for the entire team to meet them together anoko mega is working in the bang valley in arunachal pradesh Bandana Al Aurora is working in the Nicobar Islands. Pooja Mitra, who many of you I'm sure who are sitting here and listening in on the conversation are cheering for right now because she's working right here in Goa. Now, just to quickly give you very briefly some information about all of the finalists because I'm sure you can always go on to our website if you are interested in the work that they do and i feel very strongly about the work that they do and i would highly recommend because we have full youtube videos on their work so in case you are somebody who doesn't like to read we've got everything even visually represented for you so here we go with the imagery and while we're going through the imagery i'll try to tell you about each project so we have balipara foundation who are working on a project called rural futures the udalguri landscape mission and through that project they're working on the restoration and replantation of degraded forest land in bhairavkunda reserve forest with the local jfmcs as well as promoting ecotourism and the sustainable use of key natural assets next we have conservation wildland trusts who are working on con uh, community based wildlife conservation and gener are generating alternative livelihood in three villages around pench tiger reserve in madhya pradesh and maharashtra to reduce forest dependency Next we have Narayan Sharma whose project is prioritizing habitat fragments and implementing conservation strategies for the western hill of Gibbon and upper Assam. He is working along the flood plain south of the Brahmaputra river on habitat conservation and restoration. Next we have Earth Day Network India who are working on a project called Saving the Hangul. They are trying to generate public support through thoughtfully created campaigns and shaping policy to protect the endemic and critically endangered hangul deer. in dachigam national park jammu and kashmir 
that's some of my favorite imagery because I got to go to Dachikam while it was snowing and trekking through that snow with one of my idols, conservation idols, Nazim, was amazing. Next, we have helpers who are working on conserving freshwater turtles in the Brahmaputra River system through capacity building and community participation. They're working in, uh, in Assam on issues of captive breeding, anti-poaching, combating the pet trade, and awareness generation to prevent accidental, uh, sorry, to prevent accidental turtle bycatch in, uh, while fishing for other um, fish. <laughs> yeah. Finally, we have, and sorry, not finally, but <laughs> next we have Seed Trust. Oh, again, my videos are just not behaving today. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very sorry about this. All right, let's try and find Seeds Trust. There we go. Seeds Trust is working to conserve the gray sandal rawish and its habitat in Ayalu, Tamil Nadu, and they're working to promote sustainable use of resources through livelihoods training and garner community support for the protection of the gray slender loris. Next, we have Wildlife Conservation Society of India, who are addressing the turtle, Indian turtle crisis via a multi dimensional approach. They're working to reduce the turtle trade, monitor and protect nests of endangered turtle species, in situ and ex situ conservation action for five turtle species in the key habitats of Uttar Pradesh, Assam, and West Bengal. Then we have Center for Environment Education, who are mainstreaming com community conserved areas for biodiversity in uh, conservation in Manipur. They're working on the creation, demarcation, and mapping of CCAs around Zyla Wildlife Sanctuary. Then we have Omkar Foundation who are working on community-based habitat conservation and monitoring in Park Bay, Tamil Nadu. They're establishing micro uh, uh, seagrass transplantation sites and permanent seagrass monitoring sites with the help of trained and certified local scuba divers. Now on the screen, we have Atri, who are working on the conservation of a freshwater oyster, which is a 120 million year old Gondwana relic called Pseudomalaria Dali. And they're working along the Tonga and Bhadra rivers in Karnataka. That's me right before the Kadra flooded. That's, uh, sorry, the Tunga flooded. That's me running away from it. <laughs> then we had University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, who are working on population modeling and identification of breeding stock for the Hispid hare. They're working in collaboration with the Forest Department of the Dwa Tiger Reserve. Now we have Anoko Mega, who is working on the conservation of the Mishmi Hills Hulok given in Mahao Wildlife Sanctuary. Sanctuary sorry. The Bang Valley Arunachal Pradesh, and he's mobilizing community support to protect the gibbon and building connectivity between fragmented gibbon habitats. And that's one of my favorite gibbon pictures. <laughs> we now have Dr. Bandana All Aurora, who's working on bats, the, ne the neglected taxa, and is working to protect the endemic Nicobar flying fox. She's protecting and studying roosting sites and foraging patterns of the endemic flying fox with the help of the local communities. And finally, last but not least, is Pooja Mitra, who is enabling responsible marine wildlife-based tourism livelihoods in Goa. And through her central social enterprise, Terra Conscious, Pooja aims to work with 200 boat operators in the Guadas and Kerry Bay to promote responsible and ethical dolphin watching practices. And now that brings me finally to the end of my presentation. And I, I think you all should pat yourselves on the back because you've just sat through a presentation on 21 applicants who are working across the country. And um, thank you all for actually having the patience to, to sit through that. And now I believe, King Venkat, do we have any questions? Um, I can't see any on the screen yet. We'll give, some, give them time to absorb that. Okay, think, all right. But in the meantime, I just wanted to tell you, uh, Trisha, and of course all the attendees, that it was a very humbling experience being a part of applying for the grant. And particularly when we all got together in Delhi, I mean, I'm not somebody who knew what was happening in the rest of the country. And I think by this, your eyes have been opened to seeing in the remote corners of every part of the country, there are so many people doing so much of good work. And uh, winning the, the uh, uh, grant that we did was actually a bittersweet experience because there were so many people you felt, you know, were in the running and who really, really deserved it because they've all been doing such a fantastic job. So, you know, Venkat, you've got me very emotional right now because as I was saying, I really want to talk about our finalists because that's exactly how I feel. I mean, we can't, we never know who's going to win it. And for us, every time we are, and I personally get to announce who are the winners, as you know. Yes. And for me, while I'm 
very excited for the winner. I'm also looking at the other finalists and I'm like, please apply next year because the work you're doing is so amazing and so important that we need to fund this. We need to expand this. And I actually tell a lot of our finalists, please tell me and I'll help you apply for other grants because as a grant giver, I kind of have now gotten the gist of what people want to apply for. Yeah. But if you'd let me just come back to the actual um, jury meeting. So that's one of the things we do, which is quite unique as a grant giving agency is to bring all of our finalists under one roof and you actually stay together, as you know, for a good three days and you get to mix and mingle and share your ideas. Yes. And the idea is also to just kind of ensure that if we're trying the same methods or if we're facing the same challenges in different parts of the country, we're creating a platform where people can also very openly, as much as we share our successes, share the challenges and share our failures so that we can also prevent other people from making the same mistakes and save them that time and energy wasted. And um, that's one of the things that I find most heartwarming about the grants, especially seeing this year's group of grants, 2019, we still have the group running. Everybody's still very active. Every day people are sharing the work that they're doing. They're sharing not only the successes that they've had, but the, um, the learnings that they've had along the way. And so it's been great. And it's a very humbling experience for me because even after 10 years of working in conservation, I learn something new every time I visit one of our applicants on ground. Yeah, so you do realize that this is actually the first in the series we are going to be running. <laughs> I because, do realize. Yeah, because I want to invite each and every applicant, not just the winners, but yeah. all of them one by one. And I'm going to go through it alphabetically so you don't accuse me of... Um, I would you know. never accuse you. In <laughs> fact, if you've noticed, all of my finalists are also listed al alphabetically. Yes, that's true. That's the only way we can do justice to something like this. So yeah. I want them to come and give, give them a basically a platform for them to share their work more in detail and more in depth and tell Absolutely. us about what exactly they're doing, you know, Absolutely. which would be a lovely thing yeah. to do. Um, you took us through your selection process, which is actually very, very stringent. <laughs> I, I found myself talking to auditors. I found myself talking to you and... Uh, your colleagues and then flooded with all kinds of forms and Excel sheets and uh, documentation, blah, blah, blah. But I think at the end of the day, uh, it was my charm and good looks, which got me the funding. And I'm your sorry. duffel bag. And, and, my uh, duffel we bag. Were and your duffel bag. Do you want to share Venkut that actually, with us? <laughs> yeah. So Venkat walks into the jury meeting, a very serious meeting. Everybody is suited in their ties. We've got it in our little corporate boardroom. And Venkat's like, I've got my duffel bag outside. You can give me the money. As soon as you give me the money, I'll leave and I'll go start my work. And I'm sitting over there because uh, I've got all of these very important people looking at me like, Trisha, what's going on? And I'm like, listen to the work. I mean, that's Venkat. Like, you have to just know him to understand that. But the work he does is fabulous. And I think they saw the value in the work that you do. And hence, you ended up with the grant. So that and my good looks. Don't forget my good looks. Oh, yes, yes. The very charming good looks. I swoon. That's exactly why, like, you got the grant. Precisely. But on a very serious note, I have no selection in the grants. I have no process, no plan to No, I disagree because I think, uh, you know, seriously, Trish, it, uh, you have helped the, I have seen not just with me, but also with other uh, people where we need help and guidance. You've always been there. And that was the important part because. For me, particularly, I was a first time applicant to any grant, you know, so we are at sea, basically, literally, uh, forgive the pun, uh, in trying to figure out how to present something and what you are looking for uh, in terms of being able to decide, because I know it's not an easy job yeah. trying to figure out between all the different applicants yeah. who have been there. So that handholding was required and it very essential. I'm so glad you so found that, that helpful. And um, oh, yeah, yeah, that's something I tell anybody. It's not just our applicants. It's not just our finalists. Like this is one of the important lessons that I've learned because I used to be on the other side of the table. I worked for WWF India. I worked for Wildlife Protection Society of India. And I wrote proposals for them for a good uh, eight years. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of things I've learned now being on the other side of the table that didn't occur to me when I was working 
and writing the proposals. Oh. Mm. Um, I have a better understanding also now of what corporate funders are looking for having been uh, supported by the HCL ecosystem. Uh, so that's been an eye-opening experience and I'd love to share that with anyone who wants to listen. You're welcome to get in touch with me at thehabitatstrust at hcl.com. That's our email ID, thehabitatstrust at hcl.com or our Instagram handle at the Habitats Trust. I actually personally look at all of those, much to the dismay of everybody who else is managing the Instagram. <laughs> so there's actually a lady called Shikha Rang Rangra, who's been asking, what's the process of joining this program? So I think Shikha, you got the answer to that. Get in touch with uh, Prisha and she'll be very happy to help you with this. There are people still posting questions on the chat group, please, you will need to repost on the QA group and we are looking at that now. Uh, Trisha, you on your screen, you can actually have a look at that. It will stop me from reading the questions. Oh, okay. Uh, you oh, so you don't want to read the questions for all the if you prefer, If you prefer me to do that, I will do that. So you Siddharth... Do a little bit of work also today. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Siddhartha Ganesh is asking, will there be any 2020 grants considering the current situation? What is THT planning for the remainder of the year? So yes, I'm very happy to report that we will be announcing a grant even in 2020 because we actually opened our application portal in the month of January and we closed our application portal in the month of February. So everyone had already applied to us before the pandemic set in. And these are projects, I think, especially given the current situation, given everything, I mean, the pandemic is a perfect example of our exploitative nature with, I mean, relationship with nature and how important it is for us to change that and conserve it. So to this year, more than ever, we are gung-ho come hell or high water. We will be announcing the grants and we've actually taken our field evaluation process and are now working on an online evaluation process where we're trying to involve the local communities. We're trying to involve the forest department representatives videos of the species and the habitat since we can't personally go there and see it and uh, that's how we're working as of now and um, by December this year at the latest we will have our next set of grant recipients and I think the second part of the question was what does THT have planned for the remainder of the year so right now we're running on the brink um, it's available on our website it's actually a television series that we made uh, in association with the Gaia people and HCL Corporation. And it covers eight species in the first season. You can catch all of the episodes on our website. And we are currently in post-production for season two, which we hope to launch by the end of this year. Apart from that, we had a lot of field, field work planned, which we're now trying to play by ear, uh, try and get as much prep work done online. And every day is a new adventure in these new COVID times. So just trying to maybe go out there, capture some lesser known species footage if possible, try to do a lot more engagement and awareness for lesser known species online, which we try to do through Instagram, but we're also going to try and do some visual representation. So this is the problem now, because in COVID times, we are all uh, desk bound, having to look at <laughs> little screens. And uh, like I said before, Vincent, I don't think I, I don't think we should complain as somebody who was uh, in Delhi for four months and has now come to Goa. Don't complain to me. I was in an apartment here. We're getting fresh air. No, no, no. Monsoon, hang on, hang on. I am, I am the happiest person with this because I'm getting to do a lot of stuff, meeting a lot of people and inviting them onto this panel to be able to even talk to them. Otherwise, they would not give me the time of day <laughs> because everybody would be running around so much. <laughs> well, Take I will always case. give you the time of day. Thank you. No, Thank you. always. <laughs> Thank you. No, but what I'm saying is airlines are folding because of you're not traveling. See? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, uh, moving on. The pandemic on. better finish so I can restart. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, Shikha's question I've already read out yeah. earlier. Process. So we'll move on to the next one. Right. Karthik, is the grant only provided for conservation and protection of wild habitats or species? in or around protected areas or also for projects around countryside or urban green habitats? So uh, we actually fund natural habitats that can be located anywhere, but we actually have come up with a definition that we look at for natural habitats. This should not be a plantation which has changed the essential ecological function of the area. So that's what's important to us. The essential ecological function and the, uh, the biodiversity that has historically existed in that area must persist. And that's how we define our scope of work. 
um, just to mention, if you're looking at urban green spaces or country sites and you believe that it doesn't fit into the gambit of conservation, our uh, partner, I mean, our umbrella organization, HCL, is also running an environmental grant. We look at more of that environmentally geared restoration work and we look at more of the natural habitats and conservation of endangered species of flora and fauna. Okay. Um, all right, so that, that has, I think, answered her question. Next one, I don't believe is a question. It's just a pat on your back. Excellent webinar. Congratulations <laughs> to you and me. Oh, it's Vance. Oh, Vance. thank you, Vance. He's tuning in all the way from Colorado in America. So How wonderful. That's he's excellent. He's actually one of the people who runs the Wild 11 Congress, which all of us were gearing up to go for and were super excited about. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's uh, the founder of Wild Foundation and he's been a personal mentor to me. So thank you for joining in. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Vance. Uh, Siddhartha Ganesh says, fantastic presentation. Thank you, Trisha and Venkat. Thanks, Anita, Sid. Anita George, who's a marine biologist with uh, NIO in Goa, says, great presentation. I want to know what challenges you face during your visits in remote areas. Oh my gosh. Uh, where do I begin? So we had the bright idea of doing our field visits right in the thick of monsoon, August last year. <laughs> so as I mentioned briefly during the presentation, we were on the banks of the Kadra River. The day after we left, Kadra River was a red zone. People were being evacuated. The area where I was standing, someone sent me a picture, was completely immersed in water. Uh, I remember walking through the forests in uh, Sindhudurg, if I'm not mistaken. And I had leeches falling on my head from the tree canopy. Uh, so I went home and I had leeches on the back of my neck. I had some inside my hair. My boots were, of course, full of leeches. Another hazard of the monsoon. Uh, some of the more exciting stuff that happens to us. I mean, the same thing that happened at Kadra happened to me at the Kaveri River. It happened to me at Tungla River. It happened to me at Bhadra River. And then as I was telling uh, Venkat, because we try and reduce our carbon footprint, I was using Goa as the base to go into Karnataka. And if you remember last year, the highway between Goa and Karnataka had a landslide. Yes. Guess who, guess who passed oh, that road four God. hours before the landslide? <laughs> <laughs> Never a dull moment. Four hours. But apart from that, I think some of the key challenges we face, and this is something I need to work on personally, is to learn new languages. Um, because I speak only Bengali and Hindi and English, I do face some challenges when I'm trying to evaluate projects in the South. And I also feel like I may not be able to do justice when I go back and represent these projects to our sub-jury. So if anyone who's listening in is volunteering to teach me maybe some Konkani and some, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Any language Not Konkani, you not Konkani. <laughs> uh, Marathi, Kannada, anything. Yes. Yeah. Kannada, so Telugu, I'm Tamil. Happy. I'd love to learn some of the languages so I can do a better job of representing these yeah. wonderful conservationists and the good yeah. work they're doing. Lovely. Writing proposals so, is a challenge, says Abhijit for a beginner like me who has just completed masters and wants to work in the field of conservation. Ma'am, any suggestions to make a good proposal for an early career conservationist? So a good proposal is made out of representing to the organization or the funding agency that you're applying to three, a few things. The first is how strong is the problem statement? How urgent is the work that you're proposing to do? And a great way to represent that is to provide some context about the landscape, to provide some examples of the issues that have occurred in the landscape, as well as the status of the target habitat and species. What are the threats that this species is facing? For example, if it's poaching, always attach some news articles that actually have been covered by the media about poaching in the species. So that's a very strong problem statement. The second is your activity plan. And now, as you've mentioned, you're an early conservationist, so you can't really rest upon your previous work experience like many organizations and individuals who've been working for decades can. Uh, so for you, it would be very important to represent to your funding agency that first you're spending their budget in the most transparent manner. So a highly detailed budget telling them exactly what each thing costs and where their money is going. That provides them a little bit of um, uh, faith in you. 
Then the next thing would be also when you create your activity plan, if for example, you're saying you want to run an awareness program, what we do more often than not in conservation is say that we'll do a pre-work and post-work survey. But how are we constructing these surveys? Is there any volunteer psychologists or sociologists who would be willing to come and actually rather than doing a survey where you say yes or no or take the answers, to have open conversations with the communities and through that understand whether they're using certain keywords that represent to you that they've understood what you're trying to communicate to them. Another important thing is to make sure that your monitoring is an ongoing process, not just before you start and after you finish because you lose an opportunity in this. Because, For example, if your awareness program is not working and you find out two months into your project, you can always realign that, reconstruct that going forward. When you do a pre-work, post-work survey, you lose that opportunity to really tweak your uh, strategy or your action plan in the middle of your project. And uh, that's very important to have an ongoing assessment process. I hope that's been helpful. If you need more information, I'm sure you can get in touch with Benkert and he'd be happy to share my contacts and I'm happy to sit with you and take a look at any proposals you may have and help you strengthen those. Sure. We'll, we'll pass on the information for sure. Uh, Anit Chira has got a question. Is the grant being given to any serious person who is interested in conservation or should a person need to have a master's degree? I think I should answer this. <laughs> I don't no. have a master's degree. I don't have anything. I just have a passion. I think that's the overriding factor. It's always oh, better, really? of course, if you have somebody who's an expert in the field with their relevant degrees. Am I right, Prisha? Very, very so rightly I think put. Um, so yes, we go and give the grant to anybody who's passionate. But as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we do look at who your project team is. And on your project team, for example, when Benkert was proposing to do coral reef restoration, he's not a marine biologist, but we saw that there was a technical expert who was going to be assisting him with the process. And that gives us a little more faith that Benkert would be able to carry out the project. Similarly, if you want to talk, well, Benkert has still got an organization, but we had Anuk Omega who is an Ido Mishmi, a local Ido Mishmi tribal, and he was one of our finalists. And he had actually tied up with a scientist called Samiran Patkiri, who was going to help him do the surveys and the assessment. Whereas Anoko has already proven and worked in his own individual capacity on doing the restoration of the fragmented gibbon habitats. So that's what we look at for even for individuals. If you've been going out there, you've been working and you're passionate about it. That's what matters to us. So, and she also says she knows Kannada, Telugu, and Tamil Kodava. So you can, she can I teach think all I got these my tutor. <laughs> That's it, you've got it. There's an anonymous attendee saying, ma'am, it was a great insight into the work done across the country in different fields. So what I wanted to ask was, how does an organization or group manage the grant provided by the Habitat Trust on a particular project? And how do they arrange for more capital if or when required? So this is a very good question. So we do have an ongoing assessment project through the entire grant duration. Uh, this includes a quarterly report that's provided to us by our grant recipients, as well as we physically go and visit their project sites. Unfortunately, this year we haven't had, had that opportunity. But we visit their project sites in quarter one and quarter three to also understand how the project is working on ground, if we can help our uh, partners in any way. We sometimes help our partners with the si correct scientific experts if they haven't been able to secure those. We also put them in touch with other people who have experienced the same challenges or are working on the same uh, conservation threats so that there's a no knowledge sharing and idea sharing. Coming to the next section about how do you arrange more capital if required, we do allow our grantees to apply again for the grant but not in consecutive years. So for example, if you've won the grant in 2019, you cannot apply in 2020, whereas in 2021, you can apply again. But more often than not, we would say don't apply for exactly the same project because it's very difficult for us to justify that when there are various other people who are looking for seed funding to try out new uh, methodologies or to scale up projects. So you can try the same project, but as a scale up, yes, that would work, but not the same identical project. Um, and if they need more capital, we also sometimes help our grant recipients with writing proposals and applying to the right funding agencies because we also do do a lot of homework on who are providing funding and what kind of, uh, what are their priorities. 
Apart from that, uh, in case of emergency relief, like in the case of Aranyak, who are currently dealing with the African swine flu and urgently needed some emergency relief to upgrade their biosecurity measures for the pygmy hog. Um, in those cases, we do look at funding and we have provided some funding to Aranyak to help them in this current situation they find themselves in. Uh, Venkat? Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we have run out of questions and we're also running out of time. Well, I have to thank our audience. I mean, I'm so touched that they've actually stayed on for so long and they've sent in such good questions. It's been such a joy answering their questions. Yeah, we always get a good interactive crowd. So it's, uh, it's uh, nice to see all the questions coming through. Yeah, this was a lot so of fun. <laughs> it was indeed, yeah. Thank you so much for being here and making this happen. I know I've encroached on your time at home with your mom and uh, you took the time out to make the presentation. I needed a break. <laughs> good, good, good. But so, I also want to take this opportunity. Before you give the closing remarks, let me quickly slip in a little bit. I want to thank you, Venkat, for always being such a gracious host, for having me on this webinar and also for letting me tag along to your multiple dives where I am just mostly that little balloon that you have to catch which keeps floating away <laughs> and um, it's been such a wonderful experience getting to know more about your work interacting with not only you but your entire team and i'm um, also one last sentence sure. thank sure. you to all of our finalists all of our recipients for everything they've taught me for being always right on the other side of a phone call whenever i have any queries and also for being such gracious hosts when we went go to visit all of them in the field I mean, I've never, and being a woman who travels across the country, people ask me, have you ever felt unsafe? Not once have I visited the field and felt unsafe because all of our finalists, our semi-finalists and our recipients have taken such good care of me on the field. That's very true. And I'm coming after you guys next. So I'm going to get each and every one of you. <laughs> and you'll be sitting where Trisha is now and answering all the questions we're going to be throwing at you. All right. So thanks again and thanks to thanks to SSI for hosting this and of course the audience because like uh, Trisha said you stayed and stayed the whole length and uh, made this a success. Thank you so much. Wish you all the best for all the new uh, contestants that you're going to be coming through with and uh, I really look forward to coming to Delhi and meeting them. Oh, at some point in time do. after all this is over, after, yeah. That'll be I'm so. thinking now that we've run for three years, we must have a meet and greet for 2018, 2019 and 2020. Fantastic. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Great. <laughs> all right. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.